the Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 75 years for its contributions to science and the humanities. Here in its many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are constantly probing into the still unknown secrets of science, which, when discovered, will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you, the people of America. Each week, we look over the shoulders of today's scientists and catch a glimpse of the results of their research. This week, we will demonstrate the usefulness of useless knowledge. To introduce this week's program, here is Lynn Poole of the Johns Hopkins University. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. A few weeks ago, I was showing a friend of mine through one of the laboratories at Johns Hopkins University where he was talking with a research scientist. And he asked this scientist a question. He said, this is all very wonderful, but what does it mean? What value has it? How can you use it? The scientist said, I don't know. I'm just looking for some answers. So I referred my friend to an article in the October issue 1939 of Harper's Magazine, written by Dr. Abram Flexner. Now this article was called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. And it's all bound up with the definition of the meaning of a university. We'd like to try to answer that question for you tonight of what a university is. And I know of no one more capable of answering that question than Dr. Abel Wallman of the Johns Hopkins University, who is here with us tonight. Dr. Wallman, I wish you would begin by trying to answer for us the question of what is a university? That's a question that's been debated, of course, for centuries. There are as many definitions of what a university is as there are people, and as there are people with various interests. Some people say it's a place for students. In its worst situation, it's a place where you park your son or daughter between high school and graduation until either she or he gets married or he goes into his father's business. A more serious purpose, of course, is for students to learn what they can in the way of knowledge and in the way of learning how to develop their interests and problems of society. Some people have said it's a place where the family can learn what to do with its children after they've passed a particular age. Some people have even said it's just a place for the faculty. And that was not very far from the fact, particularly in the medieval times of universities, when it was a place where men of learning congregated to extend their knowledge and to develop their investigations. In its broadest sense, of course, a university is for society to develop those things which would make society happier, which would give it an opportunity to lessen its troubles, which might even in a material sense uh, learn uh, to live uh, both more adequately and better. To my own mind, however, a university is really not any of these things particularly. It's a place where you may search for truth, where there is both freedom of speech and where there is freedom of search for truth, regardless of where that may lead. The eminent French poet, when the Nazis invaded France, once commented as, as he was leaving the university in Paris, as a Nazi officer interrupted him when he came down, he said, what's that building for? Well, that's a building, he said, in which speech is free and where the search for truth can be carried out without any difficulty and without interference. That's really a great accomplishment. Now, what do I mean by the search for truth? That's a very abstract kind of a statement. Everybody searches for truth. Everybody who has any morals or any ethics feels that he is always on the lookout for truth. But I should like to illustrate what I mean by the search for truth by several case histories, not too many, but a series of them. And my first case history has to deal with a fellow named Josiah Willard Gibbs, a good old New England name, 
And who in the world was he? He has a connection with Hopkins, it so happens. About three quarters of a century ago, he was asked to come down to Hopkins to lecture. Daniel Coit Gilman, who was then president of the university, and who had an uncanny capacity to pick out young, promising minds, invited him to come down there to lecture. Roughly about the same time the university was born, only a few years thereafter. He lectured on analytical mechanics of all things. I doubt whether anybody really in this room or elsewhere in most parts of this world cared very much about that subject. And at his lectures, he probably had uh, a dozen or, at the most, two dozen people who were equally interested in such abstract and abstruse things. Well, what was so remarkable about this man then? Well, this man was remarkable in a variety of ways. One, in a very material way, he was remarkable because when we brought him down here to lecture at Hopkins, he had been teaching at Yale then for 10 years at no salary. I think in that sense he was remarkable, even for that day. He had a modest income which would amount to a few pennies these days. He was probably also remarkable in another sense. He was virtually unknown then and unknown now to 99 and 9 tenths percent of the people in this country and probably to the people in the world. We offered to bring him down to Hopkins as professor of theoretical physics at the handsome salary of $3,000 a year at that time. He was remarkable in another sense. He had been teaching up there for about seven or eight years, and in that time he had seven students, uh, some of whom he used to see once in a while. Uh, he had no particular fancy for uh, lecturing. Uh, he was remarkable in, a, in another sense. Uh, he very rarely lectured. He was quite unknown to most people. In a true sense, he was remarkable because the effect of his work well, what, uh, what effect did he have on the world? Well, he wrote a paper once, and in his lifetime he wrote perhaps only a half a dozen. The paper had a very fancy title. It was called The Equilibrium of Heterogeneous Substances, a very fascinating and dramatic kind of thing which very few people understood. It was very brief. It appeared in a relatively obscure periodical. It was read abroad as much as it was in this country by a handful of men. But it is said by people who know that he made an impact by virtue of those papers, which were highly mathematical in character, very theoretical in nature, on a series of industrial processes, and I shall merely enumerate them to give you some impression of why I think he was important. In the first place, he revolutionized metallurgy. He made extensive contributions by virtue of his work in mineralogy. He affected the whole science of petrology, or the study of rocks and their like. He had a great impact on theoretical chemistry. He had a great deal to do with earthquakes and volcanic action. He virtually supplied the basis on which new alloys were produced. He had a great deal to do with the heat treatment of metals, which today is considered to be a very modern <coughs> industrial process. He had much to do with the production of Portland cement in the manufacturing processes of most of the heavy industries that we know today. In the electrochemical industry, he had a great deal to do with catalysis, which those of you who read the ads in the oil industry, the petroleum industry in general, is now known as a modern invention. He even had something to do with the atom bomb in that he described quite accurately the molecular constitution of materials at that far back. Well, uh, as you describe him, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Wallman, it seemed to me that he was very much like Henry Rowland and Ira Remsen in his effects. He had one characteristic in common with those, and I think that's worth pointing out. Aside from the fact that he collected no salary for most of his life, aside from the fact that he was relatively unknown, he was a kind of a simple, contemplative uh, guy, the kind of a person that you say has his uh, head in the clouds. Uh, what earthly use could he be to anybody? He was of serene nature. He was undistracted by personal ambition. And he was completely unconcerned with rewards. He didn't seem to care whether anybody read his papers or not. He certainly had no idea and certainly had no concern as to whether it had any industrial application. That was true of Roland, who's my second case history. He was at Hopkins for a great many years. 
Uh, he worked in a kind of a little cubby hole downtown, one of the buildings that's since been torn down on Howard Street. He struggled for years marking lines on a metal plate. Uh, he had an idea that there was a new way in which he could reveal a new world by what we now call the diffraction grating. It has multi-linear developments on it, and it gives us a new kind of spectrum throughout the industry in the United States today. The Roland diffraction grating is used throughout the world. Uh, that little thing that he developed in a cubby hole and incidentally is made on the Hopkins campus today better than it can be made in any industrial company throughout the world. His practical applications in electricity with dynamos, with transformers, as you move through any power plant in the country, it owes a debt <coughs> to this second individual, again quite unknown. The third one was Ira Remsen, at one time professor of chemistry at Hopkins and then later uh, its president. He dealt among other things, uh, with a lot of useless ideas. Uh, purely incidentally to some of his other work, uh, he developed and produced saccharin. Probably known to every man, woman, and child in the world, and certainly known to every diabetic in the world. It's a substitute for sugar. As you know, it has many, many thousand times uh, the sugary taste and value uh, that ordinary sugar has. It probably, in turn, revolutionized the world in many industrial processes. Again, uh, that was not known when he was searching for it. It was while he was looking for something else that he found this particular compound. Well, in the end, uh, Dr. Walmer, what would you say that these things mean to a university? I've often thought that these three men alone produced enough in a period of three quarters of a century to have created most of the industrial activity in this world. Those three men, uh, their collective salaries over all the time that they were actively at work uh, would amount to a pittance. But what they produced, and I've tried to make a very, very rough kind of estimate of this, uh, would amount in the industrial fruits of the world to trillions of dollars. Those of us, of course, who are already uh, baffled by billions of dollars on federal budgets uh, would find it hard to conceive of trillions of dollars, but that's what they produced, three men. Well, Dr. Woolman, I think your philosophy that you built and the case histories that you've told us certainly prove that useless knowledge, often thought of as useless knowledge, certainly is, is useful. And to you at home, I would like to say that Dr. Woolman has built for us here a philosophy of what a university is and how useless knowledge becomes very useful to you and to me. But we'd like not to stop there. We'd like to give you a few demonstrations. Demonstrations in the field of medicine to show how useless knowledge becomes very useful. And with us we have this week Dr. Francis F. Schwenkter of the Johns Hopkins Hospital to give us these demonstrations. Well, medical science has benefited greatly by the basic laboratory investigations uh, of the scientists. To use only one example, the physicists and the electrical engineers have themselves produced the tiny electric light bulb which makes it possible to develop instruments which can be introduced into the human body. We can show you one of these tiny electric light bulbs and it is no larger in size than a grain of wheat. And yet this little electric light bulb attached to an instrument such as this bronchoscope, uh, which I show you, uh, can produce the illumination so that the instrument can be introduced into the lung of a patient and the physician can see what the diagnosis is and in some cases remove tumors or even foreign bodies uh, such as inhaled tacks or safety pins. I'll demonstrate how this instrument works in the body on a chart which we have here showing the patient in the proper position and the instrument is introduced down into the trachea until it reaches the lung and looking through this area here the physician is able to see through this tube by the use of the light exactly what the situation uh, is. Now instruments such as these have also been used even to go into the cavities of the brain itself. 
And this reminds me that one of the most important investigations which has ever been done in brain surgery was done at the Hopkins by the celebrated doc, uh, Dr. Walter Dandy. And he worked out a method uh, for injecting air into the brain after the removal of spinal fluid so that the brain could be visualized. I think that uh, this is called pneumoencephalography. Now, pneumoencephalography is a long word, so that let's break it down into its uh, components. Pneumoencephalography, with its components pneumo, meaning air, and cephalo, meaning brain, and graphy, meaning to demonstrate to the eye, or pneumoencephalography. I think this can be shown even more definitely by demonstrating some of the x-rays uh, which are taken uh, by pneumoencephalography. This is an x-ray uh, which is taken in the usual way, and one sees only the vault of the brain uh, and the, uh, the vault of the skull with the skull bones, the facial bones, uh, the vertebra, and so on. But the brain cannot be delineated. Now, when air is injected into the brain, it shows up the ventricles of the brain uh, so that we can see them delineated here by a lighter area or a darker area uh, in which the air is contained. Now, this is the pneumoencephalogram of a normal person. Now, the real purpose of this, of course, is to show up abnormalities as they exist in the brain. And this is the x-ray of a patient who has a brain tumor. And you will see in contrast to the former x-ray that the ventricle does not extend over into the anterior portion of the brain but is obliterated, which means that there is a tumor in this area and therefore delineates the area for the brain surgeon uh, so that uh, he knows where uh, to operate. Now, Dr. Dandy, working in the laboratory, along with uh, uh, Dr. Blackfan, worked out the entire method of the circulation of spinal fluid uh, from uh, the brain, how it was formed, how it was circulated, and how it was reabsorbed. And this discovery was actually as important to medical science as the discovery by Harvey back in the Middle Ages of the method of circulation of the blood. But speaking of blood, I think that it's only fair to say that the chemists have also made tremendous advances in their basic research uh, in uh, the field of blood. Back in the 1920s, Dr. Castle discovered uh, that if uh, liver was fed to patients with pernicious anemia, that the condition improved. And that brought a long line of laboratory investigations as to exactly what substances were necessary to the human body for the proper formation of uh, blood. And among a great many others, it was discovered that folic acid is one of the essentials. Now, folic acid, along with every other chemical, has a definite chemical formula made up of its various atoms and their relationship. And this is the formula for folic uh, acid. But it was discovered by these various workers that when folic acid was fed to mice who had cancer or leukemia, that the tumor grew more rapidly than it did otherwise. And that set off a chain of thought. If this is true, would it not be possible to produce some folic acid antagonists or substances with chemical structures which antagonize folic acid, which would cause the cancer cells to grow less rapidly. And out of a long series of investigations, a number of chemical substances have come out, one of which is aminopterin. And I'll show you here the chemical formula of aminopterin as compared with folic acid. You will notice that the chemical structure is identical with the exception that it, where in folic acid we have an oxygen and a hydrogen molecule at this point in aminopterin, we have a nitrogen and two hydrogen uh, atoms uh, at uh, that point. This is an antagonist of folic acid. And actually, these substances have been found to inhibit the growth of cancer cells. Now, I'd like to make the point clear that I have said they inhibit or slow down the rate of growth of cancer cells. They have not, up to the present time, been demonstrated to be a cure for cancer. 
Now, I'd like to introduce at this point one of our little patients uh, from the hospital, uh, Linda Gang, and her mother, Mrs. Gang. Linda was brought into the hospital some six months ago in a very serious condition. And at that time, the diagnosis of cancer was made. Since that time, she's been treated with a variety of these compounds, and you see her as she is today. Mrs. Gang, how does Linda seem to you today compared with the time she entered the hospital six months ago? Dr. Swanker, it's unbelievable how well Linda has come along. We realize that uh, she isn't cured yet, but we're praying that one of these new chemicals will cure her. Well, you're quite right, Mrs. Gang. She isn't cured yet, <laughs> but the work in the laboratory is going on, and we hope, all of us, that very shortly we're going to have the real answer uh, to uh, the condition. I think that all of us are familiar with the Blue Baby operation, which is another one of the advances which have been made in basic research. Dr. Tausig, working in the laboratory over many years, worked out the methods of the diagnosis of the various types of congenital malformations which occur. And a great many people said, oh, this is useless information because if the heart isn't formed properly, what can we do about it anyway? And at the same time, Dr. Blaylock, working in his laboratory, worked out methods uh, for which, uh, uh, the, by which these patients uh, could be uh, treated. And these two pieces of information brought together have eventually worked into the method of the treatment and operation for blue babies, uh, which uh, is utilized today and thousands of people have been benefited. Now we know that there were a great many people who said, oh, this is just useless knowledge uh, at the time. But there are here tonight at least two people who don't believe that this was useless knowledge. And I'd like to introduce them. Mrs. Van Horn, won't you and Sandra come in so that I can introduce you? This is Sandra Van Horn and her mother, Mrs. Van Horn. How are you, Sandra? All right. You're looking fine. Ms. Van Horn, won't you tell us uh, just what Sandra's condition was when she was first brought into the hospital? Well, we took Sandra into Hopkins Hospital under Dr. Towson's care eight years ago. At that time, she was very blue and could do very little. A year and a half later, Dr. Towson called us up and said that they had perfected this operation, at which time we took her back. And she had the operation and has been very benefited. Before she had the operation, uh, could she run and play and act normally? No, Sandra could do very little. She could walk across the room. Is that all she could That's do? That's about all she could do. Well, how is she now? Now she goes to school every day. She walks to and from school with the other children and takes part in all she their She really actions. lives a normal yes, life. Yes, she does. Uh, now. Well, Sandra, you look better every time I see you, and you look prettier every time uh, I see you. Well, Mrs. Van Horn, there's no doubt in your mind as to the value of the basic research that's been done on things of this sort, is there? No, we are very indebted to it. Well, that's the way we all feel. And as physicians, uh, we feel that the basic research that is done gives us the tools by which we can go on to uh, new uh, discoveries. Now, there's another interesting uh, disease in which basic research has been done, and that is in the field of uh, rickets. A few years ago, rickets was uh, extremely uh, common. There were thousands of cases, uh, and we didn't know what caused it. And at the present time, I even have difficulty finding a single case, case with which to teach my medical uh, students. But much of the basic research was done at Hopkins by Drs. McCollum and Dr. Park, uh, Dr. Kramer, and Dr. Howland. Dr. McCollum is a nutritionist, and working with rats, young rats to see what made them grow. He had them on special diets and he discovered that some of these rats uh, developed diseases uh, which he couldn't explain. And so he showed them uh, to Dr. Howland who was a uh, pediatrician and Dr. Howland uh, decided that they were rickets. 
Now, I can show you a picture of a patient with rickets uh, uh, compared uh, with uh, a normal child of the same age. And the disease is due to a malformation of the assimilation of calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen, as you can see in this chart. And without the vitamin D, calcium, oxygen, and phosphorus cannot grow into the ends of the long bone, and we cannot have normal bones. So all of this was worked out in the laboratory. We have no more rickets or very little rickets in town, uh, and the disease has been practically eliminated. We hope that laboratory research will continue so that other diseases can also uh, be uh, uh, cured. I think you see now what we meant when we said the usefulness of useless knowledge. Dr. Wolman has built up for us the philosophy that stands behind all of the research that is done by scientists throughout the free world today. And this research may often seem useless to many people. But when you hear of a discovery, when you hear of a new development in any field of science, whether it be medicine, whether it be engineering, whether it be in chemistry, whether it be in physics or nutrition, you will know that behind this lies a long series of investigation in the laboratory. Men who are seeking truthful knowledge, seeking new facts, which may seem useless at the moment, but they will become useful before very long. Now next week we are going to continue this subject and develop it further for you to show you a number of new things that have been developed for industry and for the home that came from so-called useless knowledge. So we hope you'll be with us at this same time next week when the Johns Hopkins Science Review is here again and presents the return on investment. Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole. Directed by Paul Kane. Associate producer is Robert Fenwick. Associate director, Ed Serro. Art direction is by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Joel Chaseman. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originates in the studios of WAAM in Baltimore.